Well, it's good to be here. I uh, appreciate uh, seeing you folks again. Appreciate being able to come and uh, to a different church. <laughs> Not that I get tired of preaching to my folks all the time, but, you know, it's just good to kind of get away every now and then and, you know, get someplace. I don't preach out like I used to. I used to travel all the time, and, and I found out that... Uh, that's expensive, but uh, I, I got around, I did went around a lot of places, but I'm still there in Topsfield, plugging along, helping, trying to help Andy a little bit over there as much as I can, seeing the grandkids as much as I can. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5, and uh, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul um, was motivating his people here, shooting a, what I call a shotgun message. Um, he was covering a lot of ground. He wasn't shooting a rifle, you know, one, one shot, one ball, you know, or one piece of lead. He was shooting a shotgun. Um, most times I preach shotgun messages, but occasionally I use a rifle. <laughs> you know, I can get pretty blunt if I want to, and if I need to, I can get down where the rubber meets the road. But, you know, that's not good for winning friends and influencing <laughs> enemies, you know what I mean. But anyhow, I, you, you do what God wants you to do. Before I get into this, uh, let, me just, let me just give you something. I, I want you to pray tonight. Uh, Carol is in bed right now. It's a quarter after 12 in Copenhagen, Denmark, where Carol Ann is, her and Chris and their kids. Uh, my son Steve from Maryland pastors Mercy Baptist Church in Northeast. He's over there right now. He'll be going home tomorrow night. Um, but they're six hours ahead of us. And that has been, uh, that's been kind of a problem with me because Chris and I have been real close here the last couple of weeks, and we've been texting back and forth, and um, I'm, not, I'm not complaining or anything, don't get me wrong, but we, uh, he'll text me and give me a thought. He said, you know, God gave me a thought. Well, that's good. God gives you a thought at 5 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he wakes me up at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I say, well, you know, let me elaborate on that a little bit. So every now and then I sit on the edge of the bed and I write back to him. Or if it, I need to do a little more in-depth something, I go to the kitchen table. And before I know it, you know, it's like 1, 30, 2 o'clock. Before I know it, it's 3 o'clock, sometimes 3, 30. And it gets up to around quarter 4. I say, well, I get up at 4 o'clock. Might as well just stay up. <laughs> so the other Sunday night, I was over at Rachel and Adams and, I was coming home, or the other night I was coming home, and, and uh, I go over to Andy Sunday night for church, and uh, I was coming home, and the closer I got to the house, the sicker I got. I mean to tell you, I got pain in my stomach, I got a headache. I can count on one hand the amount of headaches I've had in my life. I don't get headaches. My wife, she had migraines all the time, but I, I don't get those. But I did the other day. And Monday, oh, it's horrible. So Tuesday night, I went to bed at 6.30. And I didn't wake up till I think it was around 5, 5.30. And I fell 100%. So I guess what it was is I just wasn't getting enough sleep, you know, and everything. So I feel good. I feel good right now. But I, I said, I was over there, and I, and I mentioned that because I want to tell you something. Chris and Carol have a, have a Facebook thing they write on, and there's like 210, 15, maybe 20 now that people have said, uh, praying for you from here, praying for you from here. And I was laying in the bed the other night, and I was thinking about that, and uh, I thought, man, there's people pray, praying for Carol all over the world. Amen. That's amazing. And then I thought, I laid back and I thought, you know, I, I said, Lord, and I, and I pray all the time. I said, Lord, I said, out of 200 people, surely there's somebody that, that can get a prayer through 
You know, I, I feel like I'm so inadequate. I feel like I'm a doubter. You know, I try to pray. And I said, out of 200, there's somebody. And then I thought, Carol, she's got Chris praying and, and all her brothers and sisters and their kids. And then I thought, well, there's, there's Maddie. She's 13, her youngest daughter. And then I was laying there and the Lord tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, what about supper? And I said, oh, my soul. Chris sat down. We sat down to eat supper. Chris said, all right, let's bow our heads for prayer. And Johnny and Susie, both of them said, I'm going to pray, Daddy. And I'm sitting at the end of the table, and Chris, or uh, Adam, looked at Susie, and he said, uh, Susie, you go ahead and pray. And little Susie is what? She <laughs> might be what, four or five, maybe five years old? A little thing. She looks like a spider. <laughs> and uh, she was sitting there, and she bowed her head, and she said, Jesus, Heal Carol, Aunt Carol, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And, and I'm laying there thinking about that, and a thought hit me. Matthew chapter 18 tells us that we need to be like little children. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. She doesn't doubt. She didn't doubt that Jesus can heal her, her aunt. She just prayed and thanked him for doing it. Amen. You know, I said, I laid there in bed and I said, oh, Lord, give me the faith of Susie. Give me her faith. Yeah. And uh, so I, when I go home from here, I'm going to make me a pot of coffee and I'm going to sit on the lounge chair and I'll be sitting there all night. I'm going to be texting Chris back and forth and, and uh, I'll probably end up with another headache in a couple of days. <laughs> It'll be worth it, amen. But I want to show you something out of this portion of Scripture here uh, this evening. I uh, probably won't, I, I don't know why I say that. I don't want to keep you long. And I end up keeping you long, so I won't, I promise. All right, let's have a word of prayer before we get into the message. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here tonight. Thank you for the folks that are here. And thank you for them coming out on a rainy night. God, we pray as we look into thy word tonight that you'd, you'd show us something that we can put on our spiritual bones and something that will help us. God, I pray that you, you'd be honored and glorified by what's done. I pray for Carol. She's prepared herself for tomorrow morning as she's going to have this operation. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, just pray for her. Pray that uh, everything is fine. They're going to they're gonna operate on her. She has a tumor behind her knee on her leg, and uh, they're going to remove that tumor, and they're going to debark the bone to get all the cancer. Uh, they said she's going to be in a lot of pain. She has no pain at all right now. She's fine. She, you wouldn't even know there's anything wrong with her. But uh, the recovery is going to be a while. Um, we are sending, you already got a whole bunch of stuff, but I'm taking some, uh, I, what's it called, ivermectin. ivermectin. Uh, I'm taking that over for. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine, and he's uh, in the medical field. He called me, and he said, uh, get some of that, take it over. He said, that will kill cancer. Uh, he said, if they use radiation, which they're going to, he said, that with the radiation, he said, I guarantee you'll kill cancer. So, uh, you know, if there's any left, uh, they're going to do, they're going to wait till it heals and then they're going to do another PET scan, that's a whole body scan, and if there's that cancer in their lungs or anywhere, then they're going to start radiation. So, uh, you know, Carol's got a little road hoe yet, and uh, I, don't, I told her the other day when I talked to her, I, I just talked to her right before I left to come over here, I said, Carol, I don't even know if you're going to have to recover. I said, I believe Jesus is coming back. I look around our country, I don't see how he stayed away this long. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the only thing I can figure he doesn't want, he, he doesn't want to come back to this bunch, I'll tell you. <laughs> Man. I, 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 should, I, I, I should stop this, I, and I will. I'll, we're going to look at verse 1. But I, I will say one thing, just real quick. <laughs> I wish the, the, the I wish I just had another thought. Maybe two little things. 
I wish the president of the university, Columbia University, would give me a phone call. And I wish she'd say, Mr. Missley, would you come and, and help me? Could you clean this mess up? I'd say, yeah, you give me one hour. I'll clean it up. I, I would be really nice to them. I'd tell them, I'd say, look, here's a dumpster. We just had a dumpster come in and put the dumpster. I'm telling you what I told my folks Wednesday night. I said, there's a dumpster, and uh, the police are standing out here. Uh, I've called the police officers. They have kind of made a semicircle here. And the dumpster's right here, and I want you to take everything out of here that you want, everything that you don't want, put in the dumpster on the way out. You have one hour. If you're not off this ground in one hour, you will be shot. <laughs> now, that's just me being nice. <laughs> they did it at Kent State, didn't they? Yeah. All right. You say, oh, you shouldn't do that. Well, let me get, let me get, let me pull the scab off a little bit more. <laughs> Chris, Christy Nome, and I told my folks about this too. Christy Nome lit uh, a social media up the other day when they, somebody wrote a book about her and they said this, that she had, she had a dog. She tried to train, couldn't train the dog. So, uh. She decided she's going to try to find somebody that wanted it, and nobody wanted it, so she put it outside, and the dog killed her chickens. So she took the dog out and shot the dog. You ought to hear the comments. So I, I, I don't want to comment, but I did. <laughs> I said, good for her. So I told my folks, and, and I, the one of the comment I got was this, a woman commented on it. She said, I wouldn't, if Mr. Trump picks her, I'll never vote for him again. I said, good for you, lady. Good for you. Christy Nolan was probably the best governor that we have in the United States. But she shouldn't be a governor. She shouldn't be a vice president. She shouldn't want to run for president. She ought to stay home and raise her family. Now that I've got that off my chest, I got everybody mad. <laughs> chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. I'll try to behave myself. That was not planned. I, I honestly didn't want to do that. Somebody must have needed that, I guess. Chapter 5, verse 1, 4. We know I could stop right there and preach a whole series on that right there. A number of years ago, I worked as a janitor. When I was going to Bible Institute, I worked as a janitor at New Freedom Baptist Church in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. The, the, they had a Christian school. They had a big church and a big school. And I would go to school four days a week. I'd get home uh, in early in the afternoon, and then I'd do janitor work and drive bus and do whatever I could. Uh, for the school while I was going to Bible Institute. Then I left there and went to South Carolina later on. But the Bible teacher was Glenn Bromwell. Glenn and I were, were good friends. I had a radio broadcast, and Glenn helped me on that a little bit. And uh, in the summer, uh, they kept both of us there. The preacher there said, I want you guys to visit one day. The next day, do work in the church. Paint, you know, do do whatever you have to do, work in a bus garage, you know, we put bus springs on all the time. And every other day you'd go visit and, and work the next day. So on the one day we were visiting, we went on this road, we visited every house, not just that day, but a couple of days. And we had, it was getting toward late afternoon, there was one house at the end of the road. I looked at Glenn and said, well, I guess we might as well go call it a day. I said, Glenn, there's only one more house this road. I said, let's, let's go to that house. So we, uh, we drove down to the house, and we knocked on the door, and this woman come, and there was a screen door, and she kept it shut, and I don't, that's fine. And I gave her a gospel track. I held it up, and I said, ma'am, I said, we're from the New Freedom Baptist Church. I told her who we were. And I said, I would like to give you this. I said, I'll stick it in the door, and you can get it when we leave. I said, I'm not trying to barge in. But I said, this gospel track will give you the order of our services, and it'll tell you how you can know you're going to heaven. And she started crying. And I looked at Glenn, I said, well, what did I say? And she said, oh, wouldn't that be good to know? She said, I prayed to God this week that he would send somebody 
and tell me, or I could listen on the radio for somebody to tell me how I can know I was going to heaven. But she said, you can't know that. I said, ma'am, look. I said, now turn back to 1 John 5.13. I held the, the Bible up to the screen door. I said, could you read that verse for me? And she read, these things have been written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that she may know. No. And she started crying again. And I believe before we left that place, I believe Glenn and I led that lady to the Lord. I believe she got in. But she didn't, she said, I don't, didn't know that. Well, I've run into that a lot uh, in my life with Amish, you know, people. Uh, Mennonite, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and we were surrounded by those people. You know, traditions, they, they relied on traditions. But you don't get saved because you put money in the offering plate. You don't get saved because you're a good person. You don't get saved because you're baptized or a church member. You get saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, whether John MacArthur believes that or not. Amen. So I wanted to show you that. That's the assurance of heaven in verses 1 through 4. And, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But the assurance of heaven, I know I'm going to heaven. I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I know if I died right now, before my body hit the floor, I'd be in glory. Hallelujah. Man, oh man, why can't people understand that? You know, the Bible talks about, uh, the Bible, I, you know, all my life I've, I've witnessed to people and they said, well, you, you know, you, you can't know. And then when you get saved, you can't know you're going to stay saved. Listen, the same faith and trust that got me in, keeps me in. Amen? Amen? Adam and Eve, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, you don't turn there, but if you look back there, Eve took that forbidden fruit. But Eve wasn't kicked out of the garden until Adam ate of that fruit. You see, Adam was her head, her husband. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, I know I'm in gray area here, you know, and I just said about Christy Noam. If you go over in chapter 5 of Ephesians, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Yep. You know, a, a woman, oh boy. <laughs> a woman doesn't need two authorities. You know, they go to work and uh, they, they have a boss and, you know, and they say, well, he's not my authority. You don't show up one day and see what he's kind of authority he is. Uh, but anyhow, she didn't, wasn't cast out of the garden until Adam sinned. Adam was her head. And Christ is our head. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And we're not going to be cast out until our head sins. Hallelujah. I'm, I am secure in Christ. John 6, 37, we cannot be cast out. John 10, 28, we will not be plucked out. Jude, verse 24, we will not fall out. Amen. Amen. If, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we're in Christ. Yeah. And if the devil wants me, he's going to have to get in Christ to get me. He if he does that, he's not going to want me. That's right. yeah. Amen. You know, I, I was studying the book of Job. I, uh, the other night, Chris, Chris and I were writing back and forth. And I wrote to Chris, you know, and, and uh, he was talking about God hearing him. He said, does God, does God hear me? I said, Chris, I, and I don't remember the chapter anymore, but I said, I said, you know, the devil did a lot of things to Job. It's amazing what he did. And God left him do it. You know, and, and then Job finally, Job said, look, I, I don't know what to do. He sat down on the ash heap. He said, I don't know where God is, but I know where he was. And he sat down and he said, I'm going to sit here until he shows up again. And God didn't show up. God didn't speak until, what was it, chapter 38, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But when he did, he told them everything they said. I said, Chris, you might not think God hears you. And you might beg God and you might try to get a hold of the face of God and, and do whatever you can. But I said, God hears every word you say. Amen. We're in Christ. Hallelujah. Yes, well, yes, 
we see the assurance of heaven, we see the abundance of confidence. The Bible says in, in uh, verse 7, we walk by faith, Amen. not by sight. That's, that's our life. We walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Uh, a fellow just wrote me just, to, just today, this morning. He wrote me and he said, uh, he was talking about global warming. I said, I don't believe global warming. I said, you're just chicken little. And I gave him that <laughs> verse over there. He said, he said I'm going to tell you something, buddy. He said, you're going to look at me kind of funny. He said, when I'm in... Uh, in a few years from now, when I'm uh, swimming in, the, in Moosehead Lake the first day of January, I said, you're right, I will look at you kind of funny. Because <laughs> I told him about the Bible verse, if I can find it, I think I can find it. Um, no, I can't either. Um, I'm not sure, and I just told it to him a couple days ago. Uh, I'm not sure what chapter it is. It might be in, uh, in Gen it's in Genesis. Uh, chapter 8, verse 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. I said, so there. I said, that'll tell you about your swimming in Moosehead Lake January the 1st. <laughs> All right. We have the assurance of heaven, then we have the abundance of confidence, and then we have the awareness of a judgment. Verse, well, verse uh, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Judgment seat of Christ. Christians, we're going to stand before Jesus Christ and be judged for our works. What we've done and what we didn't do. Uh, the Lord Jesus, the one who had the crown of thorns put on his head, the one who had the nails put in his hands and in his feet, the one who was humiliated, the one who went through pain and torture and agony for me is going to judge me. Someday I'll stand before him. People say, I, I, I heard a preacher say one time, he said, man, I can't wait for the judgment seat of Christ. He said, man, I'm going to have me a time and I get all those rewards. Man, I just shudder when I think of that. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I try to do what I can for the Lord, but I, I have a fear of standing before Christ and looking over here and seeing this great big building and asking the Lord, well, what's that building over there? And have him say, well, Steve, that was for your rewards. <laughs> and I said, whoa, how come the door's open? It doesn't look like there's anything in there. And he said, no, there's not. That's my fear. I have that fear. I know I'm going to stand before the Christ, before Jesus Christ someday and give an account of my life. I'm not looking forward to that. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I try to live a God-honoring life. And then we see in verse 17 the acknowledge change. The acknowledged change. Assurance of heaven, abundance of confidence, awareness of the judgment, and acknowledged change. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Corky Robinson was his name. He used to come to our farm in Pennsylvania and buy eggs. My dad used to tell me, he said, uh, Make sure somebody's out there in the chicken house. We had a we had 360 foot long chicken house with a 40 foot section in the center where we washed and grated and stored the eggs until the egg man came. We sold some retail and sold wholesale. And we sold people would come in there to the farm and buy eggs. We had a cash box sitting on the on the counter and they'd come in and it was self serve most of the time. Dad always said, if you ever see Corky come, make sure you're out there. He said, he'll take, he'll steal everything. My dad told me one time he'd steal the gold out of my teeth. I don't have any gold in there, so don't worry about that. So he was there one day, and he wanted to, he wanted to go coon hunting. I was a coon hunter. I coon hunt at night. 
So he wanted to go coon hunting. He said, I just bought a new dog. I want to go along with you to see if my dog's any good. So after he left, my dad said to me, he said, make sure you leave your wallet in the house. <laughs> he said, if you don't, he said, Corky's going to have your wallet. And, he, you know, he was pretty close to the truth. So uh, later on, we were at a feed mill. Later on, we were at a feed mill in, in Red Lion. Dad and I, we had taken a load of corn in to get ground for steer feed. And another farmer came. His name was Jim Hawk. And he walked over to my dad. My dad was a really good Christian man. Prayed all the time. Dad used to call me on Saturday night and ask me what I'm preaching. And I'd tell him, he'd say, all right, I'll be listening to my pastor, but I'll be praying for you. And boy, I'll tell you, when he passed away, I knew it. So anyhow, this guy came up to Dad, and Dad said, hey, Hawkey, how you doing? He said, well, I'm not doing too good right now. Dad said, what's the matter? He said, I went out this morning to my barnyard. He said, right in the middle of my barnyard, he said, somebody shot one of my steers and butchered it and took the hindquarters and the backstrap and left the rest of it laying there in the, in the mess. Dad said, oh, my goodness. He said, yeah, I called the state police. And I know who it was. Dad said, who? He said, I found a wallet laying there. He said, belongs to Corky Robinson. That was Clarence's nickname, Corky. Corky was a, what Corky did for a living, he hauled moonshine liquor from Red Lion, Pennsylvania to Baltimore. That's what he did for a living. And uh, so he said, when the state troopers came there, he said, I gave him the wallet and I told him, I said, I want you to go have him arrested, put him in jail. And they said, we can't do that. They said, anybody could have laid that wallet there. He said, you know as well as I do, who did this? And they said, well, we can't do anything about it. He said, all right, I will. And this is what he told my dad. He told my dad, and my dad just stood there. Dad was a godly fellow. My dad just stood there and kind of shook his head. He said, I told the state troopers, if he comes on my farm, Anywhere on my farm, I will kill him. He said, I told him I'm going to shoot him. State trooper said, oh, you can't do that. He said, and keep him away from me. Well, that was before I was preaching. I, I, uh, I didn't, you know, that was before I, God had called me to preach. And I was, I was doing some preaching. I had a radio broadcast, but I didn't have a church. And uh, Susan and I were sitting in a little Baptist church that we had gone to. And... On Sunday, one Sunday morning, a guy got me by the shoulder and shook my shoulder. And I turned my head like that, and I looked up, and I saw this guy with his hair slicked back nice, and he had a suit and a tie on. And, and he said, Steve, how are you? I'm your brother now. And I stood up, and I looked at him. I said, Corky? <laughs> he said, yeah, he said, you know, I was going through Red Line, and he said, I had my radio on, and he said, I heard this preacher. It was Oliver B. Green from down in Greenville, South Carolina. And he said, I heard, heard him preaching, and he said, if you had never got saved, he said, you need to get saved. He said, I couldn't even see the drive. I pulled over, and he said, I got saved. Amen. And, buddy, I want to tell you, he got in. He's gone now. He's in heaven, him and his wife both. His nephew pastors the church down East Main here. And uh, so anyhow, he, uh, he went to Bible school, started preaching. <laughs> he came up to see us one time. And he was talking to the girls, and our kids, and, and I told him, I said, Corky, I, he said, oh, I could tell you some story. I said, Corky, you sure could. <laughs> and he told the kids, he said, I'm not going to tell you some of my stories, but he said, I want to tell you this. I bought a coon dog one time, and your dad and I went out hunting, and it wasn't any good. And I told that guy, I'm going to come down, and he said, don't you dare. I'm not giving your money back. Corky said, if it wouldn't have been for my wife, I was going to drive to his house, and his house was in Georgia, and this was in Pennsylvania. He said, I was going down to his house. He said, I was going to burn his house down. That was Corky. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Amen, amen. When he came up to see us, he was a pastor. Isn't that something? He's a preacher. I, uh, I had a church.
church. We, we started a church in Pennsylvania called Faith Baptist Church. And one Sunday, this fellow came in. There was, there was another guy. He was just a little skinny guy. His name was Harry Scott. He hung around with Corky all the time, and I lost contact with Harry. Harry was, he was a blister. He was just like Corky. Well, Clarence got saved, but Harry didn't. So this couple came to church. He was a great big, tall, thin fella, and he had long hair, and he had a belt buckle with a banjo on the belt buckle. And his wife was just a little short thing, and they came to church, and they came a couple Sunday mornings, and one Sunday morning they walked up, and they said, we want to get saved. And I took them over to the side, and I led them to Christ. They were faithful. They and they loved God. And one Sunday, we were walking out of church, and this little girl said, Pastor, I said, you don't know who I am, do you? I, I knew her name, you know, and I said, no, I don't think so. She said, I'm Harry Scott's daughter. I thought, oh, my soul. I just, I just guess my mouth got to come open. I, she said, would you pray for my daddy? I said, I sure will. Well, Lord took us to, took us to Virginia. Then we were there five years, and we came to Maine. And I went down, and uh, one time, there was a little store down there. They sold guns and stuff. And, and uh, so one evening, we went to that little store. And when it was down, seeing my folks, and we were walking through there. And I see this guy coming to me, and he was grinning. Just a little guy, a little thin fellow, and he was really grin, dressed up really nice, hair combed. And he come up, he goes, hi, Steve. And I, I looked at him, I stopped, and I looked at him, I said, hi, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. And he said, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, well, you must know me. But I said, I don't know who you are. He said, I'm Harry Scott. He said, my daughter led me to Jesus. He said, I got saved. I could tell you stories like that, but I want to tell you two more quickly. Pete Boyd. Pete had a body shop right outside of Red Line, a town we lived in. He was a rascal. He wore turquoise bracelets and necklace, tattooed all over. He was in a motorcycle gang. He had a big Harley. He had a body shop, and he had an office with glass all around his office. He kept his Harley chopper in his office. And he was, he was a mean rascal. There was only one person meaner than him, and that was Mert, his wife. She was just a little kind of a chunky redhead. She was as mean as a junkyard dog, buddy. I mean, she would cuss... Uh, people would come there, salesmen, and she'd cuss and she'd use words I never heard before. I saw her back up people up, guy salesmen, and almost they would have turned around and run to the car if they would trusted her. <laughs> One day my dad said, did you uh, hear about Pete? Pete Boyd. I said, no, what's the matter? He said he went to the hospital. He had a heart attack. I said, oh, man. Dad said, yeah. He said, Pete's not saved. I said, well, how, I wonder... I said, is he home? Dad said, yeah, he just come home the other day. So that, that night, or the next night, I'm not sure, I took one of my sons with me. We went to church. It was our visitation night, and I went there, and I told the guys, I said, you guys are on your own. But I said, tonight I'm going to go see Pete, Pete Boyd. Oh, preacher, don't, no, preacher, don't go to see, you, you let your boy here, you take one of us. We can, we can handle that. You don't want to go in there with her. I said, I, I, I said, I've been praying about it. And I said, I believe God wants me to go see Pete. So that night, we did. I think it was Jimmy. I'm not sure, our second son. We went. I heard the TV blaring in the house. I knocked on the door, and I heard Mert say, Head there! I said, Mert, this is Steve Nisley. Well, come in! <coughs> I opened the door, and I walked in. TV was blaring. They were raising two of their granddaughters. And they were laying on the floor watching television. She was sitting over on the side. I don't know what she was doing, but she was sitting there. And Pete was in a lounge chair over here with his feet up on a hassock. And he was sitting there. He didn't have a shirt on. That's how I knew he had tattoos all over him. And he had these necklaces on. He was a, he was a rough looking guy, but he was just rough, period. And so he said, Come on in, Steve, sit down right there. So I did. 
I sat down and I said, Pete, I, I heard you're in the hospital. I said, I just want to come and see you. I said, Pete, you know, if you'd have died, you know where you'd have went before he could even open his mouth. His wife says, yeah, he'd have went to hell. That's where he'd have went. Oh, boy, here we go. I said, well, Pete, I don't want to hold you up. I said, all I want to do is tell you a little bit about Jesus. And I said, then I'll go. He said, that's fine. Go ahead. So I took my Bible and I gave him the gospel. And while I was giving him scripture and the gospel, he said, Rosie, turn that down a little bit. So she turned it down three times. He said, Rosie, turn that down a little bit. She turned it down again. After a while, he said, Rosie, turn that off. She turned it off, and those two girls turned around and watched, listened to me. And Mert was sitting there and never said one word after that. And I gave him the gospel as clear as I could give it to him. And I said, Pete, I closed my Bible, and I said, Pete, can I pray with you before I go? He said, sure. I got down on my knees right in front of him. He took his feet off that house, and I, I leaned on that with my elbow, and I prayed. I said, oh, God. I said, you know Pete needs you. I said, he needs to get saved. He needs to change. I don't want to see Pete go to hell. And I stopped. And I said, I had my head down, my eyes were closed. And I said, Pete, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to trust Christ, reach out and take my hand. And I just glanced over like that. And he was reaching way out like that. And he got my hand. He squeezed my hand. And I led Pete Boyd to Christ. He started coming to church, him and Mert and the girls. You know, she was still Mert, but he would come and they'd stand and he'd take a songbook and he'd stand there at the back and he'd look at it. He didn't know what those songs were. They were foreign to him. And he would look at them and she wouldn't even pick a book up. Well, we had a revival meeting. And uh, I had two preachers come. One of them came Sunday, Sunday morning, preached through Wednesday night. And the other fellow was Don Hardman. He came Wednesday night and preached through the next Sunday night. And uh, we had a whole week of meetings like that. And right in the middle of that week of meetings, Susie had always loved to have the preachers there, and she made turkey dinner, mashed potatoes, all the trimming, and she had a table full of them. You wouldn't believe it. And Don, Don and Laura and I, we were all getting ready to sit down, and the kids, and, and the phone rang. Susie went and got the phone, and I said to Don, just wait a minute. So Susie came out and said, Steve, you got to get that phone. It's Mert Boyd. She's all excited about something. I said, oh, no. I thought, oh, my Pete must passed away. And I went over and picked the phone up, and she goes, preacher. I said, yeah, Mert, what's the matter? you got to get up to the house right now. I didn't get saved. I said, I'll be right there. And I hung up the phone. Well, I guess Don heard it. And I said, I told Don, I said, you just go ahead and pray and start eating. I said, I'm going to go see Mert. I said, she wants to get saved. He got up. He said, I wouldn't miss this for all the tea in China. <laughs> and we took off. We went to their house. Her and those two girls got saved. Amen. They come, They started coming to church. They were as faithful as a day is long. And so then I was in church one Sunday, and the song that I was preaching, the song we're singing, and the song leader kind of turned around like this. He said, preacher, look at Pete and Mert. And I just happened to glance back, and they were holding that songbook, and they were singing like crazy. I said, hallelujah. Amen. Bear with me, one more story. <laughs> the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Yes, sir. You know, I like to see people change. One thing that motivated the Apostle Paul to be the kind of man he was is a changed <laughs> life. People change. I had a fellow and his wife were members of our church in Virginia. They had a daughter, had one daughter. She got married to a guy and they had a little girl. And they were married for I don't know how long and she left him. He was a doper, drunk. He lost his license, uh, permanent. They took his license away for his whole life. And uh, his name was Chris. And uh, so one Sunday, he didn't come to church. One Sunday, here he comes. Now, she wasn't there, but he, he came to church. After the service, he come up, tears running down his face. He said, Preacher, can I talk to you? I said, Sure. Took him in a room, and he sat down on a chair, and he started crying. He said, Preacher, my life's shot. He said, I, 
I don't know what to do. He said, I'm, I've been in jail and out of jail. He said, I, I, I've had my license taken from me for the rest of my life. He said, my health is gone. My wife's gone. My child is gone. He said, I'm, I have ruined my life. I'm a wreck. He said, I need Jesus. I said, amen. I said, Chris, I said, you can have him. And I gave him the plan of salvation. I told him how to get saved. And he wanted to get down on his knees. He did. He got down there and he started confessing his sin. I said, Chris, Chris. He, he, he said, what? I said, the Lord knows all of that. I said, I guarantee you, you'll miss half of them. I said, he knows everything you've done. I said, just call out and ask him to save you. And when he got up off his feet, got back up on his feet, he went, I said, Chris, you go out there. We were in the room off the main sanctuary. I said, you go out there, and if there's anybody left, you tell them your testimony. He said, oh, I don't know what to say. I said, you tell them just what you told me right now. I said, you told me the burden is gone. Amen. So I lost contact with Chris. I came to Maine and lost all contact with him. That's been, man, that was 25 years. 20 years, at least 20 years, maybe 25, maybe 30 and uh, I got a phone call from a preacher in, down in Virginia. He asked me if I'd come down and preach for him. And I said, all right. So I did. I went down. And the kids went with me. And we were sitting there. The preacher called me to pre come up to preach. And I walked up. And the pews, there was pews here and here in the center aisle. And over here on this side, I saw a man sitting on the very front row by himself. Great big heavy guy, an old older guy, gray hair. Uh, he was sitting there and he had his great big Bible laying right beside him. He had a cane and he was leaning on his cane. He had a grin that went, I mean, just grinning at me. And I, so I opened my Bible and told the folks what scripture I was going to preach from. And I looked at him and I just kind of nodded a little bit. And I, in my mind, I'm thinking, who is that? So I opened my Bible and I'm starting to read scripture and I read about three verses and I stopped. I looked down and said, Chris, is that you? He said, yes. I said, are you still saved? He said, yes. I said, folks, it was a pretty good sized church. I said, folks, just, just stick with me just for a minute. I got to do something. And I went down off that pulpit, man, around that platform, man, we hugged each other. We had us a time. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hallelujah. A changed life. Oh, my, how that will encourage people to see a guy get saved and change, a person get saved and change. I could stand here all day and tell you stories. Of course, you know that, you know, and about people that got saved and they no longer do with the things they used to do. Jim Hawk told Dad later on, a couple of years later, he saw, saw my dad. My dad told me this. I wasn't with him. My dad said, I ran into Hawkey today. I said, oh, you did? He said, Hawkey said, hey, Joe. Did you have anything to do with cork getting religion? Dad said, well, I don't know. He said, I've talked to him. He said, man, he said, you talk about got religion. He said, he come to see me the other day and wanted to pay for that steer. <laughs> he said, I told him, I told him, I'll tell you what, when I need help on my farm, you're the first guy I'm going to call. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Isn't that something? Man, oh man, oh man. Nothing encourages you more than a person that yes, changes their life. Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here and getting in the book. And I pray for Carol. It's so much on my mind and my heart, and I think about her. God, I pray that you take her through the operation and come out of there with flying colors. God, I pray for this church. You bless it. Bless Brother Cobb as he's away. Father, our patriot will be done in our, all our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.